starting a new series on the letter to the Philippians, and I'm going to give a brief introduction to the book before we jump into chapter one. The Apostle Paul wrote the letter to the church in Philippi while he was in prison in Rome at around 62 AD. It is the first church that he planted, and how he planted it is really described in Acts 16. So as we go through Philippians in the next five weeks, uh, take a look in Acts 16 to see how it started. The reason why he's writing this letter, because Epaphroditus has come while he's in prison to give him a gift from the church of Philippi. They're giving him this gift, and as he receives it, he wants to thank them for this gift, but more importantly, thank them for their partnership in the gospel. So he doesn't mention this gift until chapter 4. He's concerned about their progress in the faith, there's some conflict within the church, and also opposition in the outside that they have to deal with. And he's writing this letter. What's interesting about this letter, it's one of the most positive letters you'll see in Paul's letters. And as scholars look at it, it takes the form of what's called in the ancient world a friendship letter. It's really his affection and friendship for those in Philippi that comes through. And along with the, uh, that, the other theme is joy. A theme of joy is throughout this letter. And we see this in verse 3 in chapter 1, what it means to pray with joy. And it's really the theme of the whole book and what does it mean to have joy as we journey in faith. The interesting thing is to ask, how can you tell if you're growing spiritually? How can you tell if there's something going on in your life where clearly you're growing closer to Christ? One of the prime indicators is that you have joy. There's joy in your life, regardless of circumstances. And the healthy church community is one in which, as we see, there's joy because there's strong partnership in the gospel. And this is what we see here, and we're going to be looking at verse 1 and 2 that's really still a little bit more introductory as well. Um, and we have Paul introducing himself, introducing the letter. It says, Paul, servants of Christ Jesus. Servants. You know, I was listening to this guy who's a Greek scholar this past week, and he says often New, New Testament, the translations of the New Testament translate it servant when it's actually slave. And I had to look up the word. It really means slave, slaves of Christ Jesus. But when we hear that, we hear that with our modern ears, and it doesn't seem like a slave. You know, our impression is, of course, the history of this nation and slavery, right? It has racial connotations and who was enslaved as well as the purpose of why they were enslaved. And actually, it lasted a lifetime for them. And in general, slaves were treated as less than human. They were not free. That is not the ancient world's understanding of slavery or how they experienced it. Slavery in the ancient world, in general, was temporary, dealing with life challenges so that if you owed somebody money and had no way to pay it there was ways in which you were enslaved and again that sounds harsh to our ears but you were indebted to them so you worked for them and you were under their lordship if you want to put it that way they were your master but there was a season in which you can buy out of that so here we have paul reserving, uh, referring to himself as slave we have it in other places in the book of Galatians and Romans, he refers to himself as slaves. And in Titus, and Peter, Jude, and James also refer to themselves as slaves. Now, how do we make sense of this? What does it mean? I don't go around and think of myself as a slave to Christ. And again, I think it's scholar. I mean, they're choosing to put servants because it just doesn't resonate with us. But the problem is when we use servants... It's as if you're at a job and you serve for a season and then, or a time period, then you go home and you have your own life and you're not serving because you're not working. And that's the problem with servants. Because when you're a slave, you're always a slave. You always have a master. There's no time off. The same way as a Christian, God owns us. He is our master. 
he has ownership of all of our life when we submit and willingly follow him. The great thing is he's a wonderful master to have, that you submit your whole life to him and listen to his word, his orders on what to do. And you were created to do that, so life will go well if you submit to his lordship and his master rule. You know, it's striking to me. We're going to look at this in Philippians 2 about Christ. It says in Philippians 2, 7, taking the very form of a servant being found in human likeness. Basically, I'm paraphrasing it. Went to death on the cross. This is Jesus. And this word that says servant in Philippians 2, 7 is the same word used here that Paul uses, servants of Christ Jesus. Jesus himself became a slave to his father, became a servant. God in the flesh, in human likeness, lived the life we should have lived, died the death we should have died on the cross, forgave us of our sin by him paying the penalty, and now we are free. Free to live under the master's rule and reign. So Paul identifies himself in that way, in humility. And then he identifies the people that he's writing to as God's holy people, the saints, God's holy people in Philippi. I hope you see yourself that way, that you are God's holy people in Ashburn or wherever else you might be, Ashburn, general area, right? We, we, we're not thinking of it like that, right? We're, well, holy people, I mean... I try to be good, but, um, you know, really? We're holy people? Yes, you are the holy people. It's living into the identity that you already have, that God has given you. And this is where Paul, in his great joy of experiencing a gift from them, wants to pray for them. So he says, I always pray with joy. He's always filled with joy when he thinks about those people in Philippi. The word joy is used 16 times in this letter, and if you happen to read through Philippians, take a look at that and how joy is coming back and back again. Now, it's delicate because he wants to thank them for the letter, but he wants to experience, uh, he wants to share with them why he's really filled with joy. It's not just because he got a gift from them. It's because they share in the partnership with the gospel. He's experiencing that partnership, that the gospel creates deeper partnership than anybody who has maybe a similar background. Or I would even say gospel partnership is stronger than anybody who happens to view the world somewhat similarly that is not gospel related. What I mean is you think the same way about certain things, but there's a deeper partnership because of who Christ is and what he's done in your life. And you're living out the gospel, and that's where the partnership is based. Not necessarily that you happen to have some things in common. You know what's striking to me, again, in the Greek, the word partnership, as it's translated here, is actually fellowship. So when we think of fellowship, you know, after service, we will have fellowship, right? We will, which is a great thing, right? We'll connect, and there'll be refreshments, and we'll interact, and people call that fellowship, or we have fellowship time. But here, and that's a good thing, of course, but here, fellowship is more partnership in the gospel, in how you're living. The partnership is related to all the commitments that you have because you are a Christian. And here, Paul goes on and says, he has joy because of their partnership, and joy because he's confident the work that God began will continue. What an encouragement. The work that God began in you will continue. So if there's ever a time where you experience God's grace, you trusted him for your forgiveness of sins, that he has done that work on the cross, and that you sense that he's changing you, forming you to be more like him, giving you a little bit more patience than you had before, giving you more love for others that maybe you didn't have before. If you've tasted that, it is a promise that God will continue to do that work until the end of the day. That he will work in you what he has started. And he will complete that work. And that is something that should give all of us joy this morning. 
that God is continually working in us. And sometimes we might think, well, it's been a struggle. My faith is kind of dry. I don't sense God's work in me. If you've trusted in Christ and believe in him, God will continue to work and will complete it. And another passage in chapter 2 that we'll get to. God, he'll continue to, work out, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So it's not trying to be this better Christian, trying to be this good Christian or a good person. It's trusting that God is working in you to do that. And it's, and it's being able to put yourself at God's disposal for he will do that work. But sometimes we resist. We resist what's best for us. One of the most frustrating things as a parent is when your child is sick and they refuse to take the medicine. Have you ever been there? Like they're sick and they have a fever, but they will not drink the medicine that will bring down the fever. It drives you crazy. Or they sprained an ankle. Now you don't want the ice on their ankle, right? It's too cold. That's the point, you know? They need healing. Or maybe, you know, you give them a Band-Aid for anything and everything. A Band-Aid makes it better, right? Even if there's not a real cut, you put a Band-Aid on. But then, of course, they don't want, to, you, don't, they don't want you to tear it off because it's going to hurt. Anything that's going to hurt, the Lord himself is going to continue to work in our lives for our good, for his glory. And we, he will have a finished work with each one of us. And sometimes it's willing to be able to be under his tender care. And sometimes it might be painful, but we know the master is good and he's loving. And this is why Paul goes into his affection for them, which is a really, um, there's a sweetness to it that is remarkable if you understand Paul as this missionary scholar who's, you know, type A, always active, always doing all these things, and yet he says he, his heart is going out to them. He has deep affection for them. Why? Because they share in the same grace. This is what's remarkable. He has had a vision in the third heaven, whatever that means. There is a letter in Corinthians that talks about this, and he has been appointed to speak the very words of God, his words as God has inspired, are in the scriptures when he preaches. He's speaking the very words of God for those people. But what does he see? How does he see himself? He sees himself as one who's experienced the same grace that they have. So this church that he's planted is not his, it's the Lord's. Their growth is credited to God, not to himself. Because he sees it as what God is doing in their life. God is active, and he's experiencing they're experiencing the same grace that he has. Now, whether he's in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, the striking thing is he's in prison right now. Life is not going well. People are opposing him. And he's filled with thankfulness because they've experienced the same grace, even during their challenges, possibly, with Lord Caesar Rome, you know, looming over them and the challenges they have as the church. He's humbly seeing them experience similar challenges. And experiencing this same grace. Do you ever experience that when you travel somewhere and go somewhere? You know, I was just in Memphis and went to church on Sunday. Uh, got there late and left early for a variety of reasons. But one of the things that struck me is when they were worshiping, have a deep sense of connection of, of course, we're worshiping the same Lord. And their, how they would communicate to one another and even the uh, the song leader and the worship leader and the, and the pastor of strong connection. Reminds me of when I went to Scotland many years ago, and I went to this church. I mean, I don't know if it's Presbyterian or not. Of course, Presbyterians, that's where it started all in Scotland. But I had heard that it's all a cappella, no musical instruments. And I was like, boy, how that's going to go. And I made sure I better not sing, you know. <laughs> That's all I need. With no music drowning out my voice, I'm in real trouble. Um, but when he sang, it was so beautiful because they didn't have a choir, but it's as if the whole congregation was the choir, singing in heartfelt devotion and thanks to God. And it was 
powerful, and I resonated with that, sensing that they experienced the same grace that I had, that I had had experience. And here Paul is saying he has deep effects and the affection that Christ Jesus has. So he's saying, look, the affection that I have for you, the Lord can testify to the affection I have. And this brings up the whole notion of friendship. And sometimes we don't think of it uh, necessarily in Paul or biblically, but this is a friendship letter. And this is clearly his communicating his affection for them in, in the nature of friendship. You know, Aristotle, way back when in my philosophy days, said the best kind of friendship is when you respect each other's character, right? When you know that you can trust and to believe in that person's character, as well as having things in common, enjoying each other's company. But a deeper friendship is when you know you have each other's back, you know you trust each other's character. And I just sense quite obviously that Paul must have been a really good friend. Think about that. Scholar, missionary, always on the run, but actually somebody who's just a really good friend. And I think that's a sign of a Christian, somebody who's a good friend. Now, I realize everybody has a different temperament, different personality. Some are extroverts, some are introverts, some have one or two friends, some are just like friends with everybody, right? You know, they're just that kind of personality. But I think as you grow and become a friend of God, and God befriends you, there's qualities and characteristics that exude sort of friendship with others. You know, I was struck by many years ago, Tom Hanks won his second Oscar as best actor. As a matter of fact, I think it was back to back years. And so he's on the top of the world in his profession, right? As an actor and they're interviewing him. How do you feel winning twice? This is what he said. I'm still figuring out how to be a good friend. Isn't that interesting? I don't know too much about him, but I think he's onto something, valuing what's more important, valuing friendship more than your success in your vocation, more than what you've accumulated in your life, what it means to be a good friend, and that takes work. And that's why I think here, he's talking about gospel partnership, Paul is, and I think it's, it's not possible to have gospel partnership exist without levels of deep abiding friendship, where you care and love each other, where there's partnership together, and you're praying for one another, because we're going to get into this, because this is what he does. He prays for the Philippians. And I think prayer is critical. Prayer changes your heart to love others and wish others well in ways that we cannot do on our own. As we're praying to God, for God to work in other people's lives. And that's my prayer for myself and our congregation, that we would learn to labor in prayer for one another. And I know we do. And often, and this makes sense, we pray for people's physical situation and predicament because those are the most clear and obvious but I wonder if there's ways we can continue to pray more often for each other's spiritual life and I think of this and maybe parents can relate in my prayers for my kids I just have a deeper yearning that they would know Christ as they grow older that they would be godly that they would make good choices and they will live a life pleasing to God and love others. It's a deep prayer and concern daily. And I guess what I'm thinking is, how do I cultivate a heart to pray for others like that as well? Not just those that are immediate, close to me, but yearn and long for. And I sense this is what Paul is doing. He's praying for his people. He has deep affection for them. And it leads him into prayer. And you know what the prayer is? This is a wonderful prayer. If you're thinking, how should I pray for somebody outside the obvious need, a physical need, or whatever it would be, or concern? How do you pray for somebody? This is how to pray. That their love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So they may be able to discern what is best. 
to pray that they would love more, that their love would abound. If you think of praying for me, please pray that prayer for me. <laughs> pray that prayer for me. And I'll be praying that prayer for you, that your love may abound. What? In knowledge and depth of insight, you're growing closer to the Lord, and you're being more like him. What a wonderful thought that the love of God is penetrating in a deep knowledge of God, of his forbearance and his kindness. And when we look at God's love, we see how he puts a high value on individuals, on a person, on the one that's loved. What I mean by that, as we grow in love, we value each person as created in the image of God, whatever they think and wherever they're at. And it also says that you will be pure and blameless as you're that they would be pure and blameless, that they're not mixed up with selfish ambition or vain conceit would get in the way, but they're growing in love. You know, there was a Facebook posting that I heard somebody refer to, and they have ways to love. And these are some of them. And these are all from scripture. Listen without interrupting. Uh, maybe I could do, you know, I think of like, oops, I, maybe I interrupted some people in the past speak without accusing give without sparing pray without ceasing answer without arguing trust without wavering forgive without punishing promise without forgetting to grow in knowledge so that you are growing in being able to love read God's word understand what he's saying and this is why it's so helpful, because sometimes people can be difficult. You know, just rubs you the wrong way, or just don't connect. And I imagine in this congregation, dare I say, I know we love each other, but there might be certain individuals, for whatever reason, we don't necessarily get along, not that we don't get along, but we're not, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> without putting it too, right? It's just human nature. In a group this size, that's going to happen, right? Even a small group of five, it can happen, right? We don't always get along with people. And Paul, later on, is going to deal with a conflict in the church. Yodia and Syntyche in chapter 4 are clearly having a problem with one another, but they share grace. They share God's grace. So how, how can we deal with this practically? What can you do? Have compassion for those who, for whatever reason, you may not necessarily get along with. Think of it as going to war. Now, that sounds like, what do you, going to war on a horse, you know, when they fought on horses. You're fighting others on horses. When you're fighting, you don't get mad at the horse, you get mad at the person riding the horse. So think of it this way. Some people are blind to what's driving them. They're held captive by it. They don't realize it. Pray that they'll see what's driving them and extend compassion, grace, and mercy. And in the same way, we would want somebody to extend that to us as well. But be, be a person who reads the Bible, prays and applies it. This is why I think an uneducated person, meaning somebody who really didn't go to school for very long, circumstances were such that they really have a limited education, but they read the Bible every day, they pray and they apply it, they're going to know God much more than the scholar who knows all the original languages and studies it day by day, but doesn't bother to apply it, knows all the ins and outs. Because it's living it out that makes the difference. It's being a person of love and able to discern, that you may be able to discern what is best. There's circumstances and situations in life that aren't obvious what a Christian should do. So it's having a keener moral sense on what is needed. And maybe it's loving when you don't feel like it. You know, there's a negative Kind of a negative example, but I'll, and maybe you've heard this story, woman goes to um, this lawyer and asks, you know, I want to divorce my husband. I can't stand him. I need to divorce. 
So the lawyer, who happens to be a Christian, says, you know what? For the next two months, love him in ways you've never loved him before. Be kind to him. Be gracious to him. Serve him. And then, at the end of those two months, drop the bomb and say you're going to get a divorce. So you know what happened. He goes back and never gets a call from her. He calls her up after a while and says, what happened? She goes, oh, I love my husband. I love him so much, I would never want to do that. The idea is that, you are to, that love isn't a feeling, it is an action. We need to be able to discern that. But there's other things that, that happen with perceptiveness. There's a scholar that says, Paul links the Philippians' perceptiveness and how to show love towards one another with their ability to pick out from a variety of competing options what is consistent with knowing Christ. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So there's times where you experience something that something is going on where you need to have wisdom in that moment with love and discernment. You know, one example would be uh, theologian Thomas Oden was once quietly experiencing a chapel service at the divinity school where he teaches. But when they served communion, he laughed because they offered it in the name of the goddess Sophia. Right? You're not going to stay there. And you're going to kind of take a stand when that happens. And I wonder if discernment for us today in public, when things are going on, when something is happening in the community, wisdom and discernment is needed. I just think, and not to get into this too much, but teachers in the Loudoun County Public Schools today, these days, need discernment. A lot is going on, don't want to get into, but how much is needed for teachers in our midst or teachers in the community to be prayed for so that their love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. They may be able to discern what is best and be holy and blameless until the day of Christ to love well, to serve well, to speak well, and to be prayed for. And that's why we need to be praying for one another. In so many ways, publicly, wherever we are, in, in, in uh, neighborhoods or work environments where there's pressure, and whatever we're experiencing, that we would pray for one another, that our love would abound. And this is why, at the end, it mentions, Paul says, the fruit of righteousness comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the wonderful thing about the Christian faith and how it fits, how the world understands how people operate. There's a guy named Dan Pink who wrote a book called Drive, which is the three primary motivations that people have, the three drives that is the most important in their life. And he says autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy I get to control over my work. I am not just told what to do. I have some input. Mastery. I'm mastering a per certain skill to improve. And purpose. There's something bigger and greater for myself. Autonomy. You know what it says? That your love may abound. Your love. You're responsible for that. It's your love that can grow. And putting yourself in a position before God for your love to grow and mastery, that you're filled with the fruit of righteousness. God is working in your life. It's not your goodness or your good deeds, but the fruit that God is bearing in you, and you give him the credit. The purpose is God's glory for his praise and his glory. Paul says, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. So being his bondservant, or we can say his slave, but doing this in community where we love and serve one another, we're growing in love for one another, and we're growing in knowledge of God, and how much more that the Lord gets the praise and the credit for what is going on. Let's partner together for the gospel as we pray and encourage each other to grow in his grace. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you haven't stopped working, that you're working in us.
this day and you're working in this congregation, you're working in our community. We thank you that you have not given up on us, that you have a purpose for us and that you will carry it on to completion. I pray for everyone here that have a deep sense of their purpose in what it means to be known by you, to be loved by you, and what you have called them to do. We pray that each one of us will take the next step to be directed and guided by you and to experience your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.